Hello again, fellow treasure hunters. Thank you for joining me once again for another exciting episode about the secret a treasure hunt. Um, this time I'm very excited to share with you the top 10 recently revealed clues or confirmed clues uh, that were discussed in the secret podcast and I'll provide a link to that video in the description. But let's dive right in with number 10. They confirmed what many of us had believed in the past that uh, the Cleveland image uh, includes a visual clue for Liberty Boulevard. For years, people thought, as the image looks, uh, that it was having to do with the Liberty Bell. But as you know, that's in Philadelphia, not in Cleveland. And so the artist, John Jude Palancar, uh, explained the confusion in that the one of the streets where the treasure was found uh, was formerly known as Liberty Boulevard. So that was very exciting because again, it kind of sets the foundation for how to interpret the rest of the clues in the rest of the puzzles. Moving on, number nine, the Boston image, a very bizarre subplot that everyone uh, thought was odd, uh, everyone being those that paid attention, uh, that it had to do with birds of prey and Boston pups. So the peregrine falcon, uh, I in my previous videos, in explaining the Boston solve, uh, I was confused what the Peregrine Falcon had to do with anything. And luckily, again, John Jude Palancar explained that it was connected to the Boston Pops. How do you ask? Well, in a very stretchy, reachy, odd way, the bubble was supposed to pop at the parrot's or falcon's beak. Very odd. Number eight. The Boston image again included uh, the witch's ribbons that I always thought were odd why they're dangling off of her arms, but they're apparently a reference to old Ironsides, the USS Constitution's flags. So these odd symbols that many people struggle to interpret are really simple in the end of the at the end of the day. And this is it. They're just the symbols on the flags on this ship, as many ships, it's a tradition uh, to have these naval symbols on their flags. This perfectly ties in and supports my San Francisco theory for Fort Mason, where the symbols on image one um, can be explained by the Fort Mason Chapel. These are the odd symbols on the uh, chapel's choir balcony. Um, uh, this is a terrible picture because it's from a distance, but when you're in there, these etchings and wood are just spectacular. They're so beautiful. And they actually do complement the image uh, symbols very well. Number seven, the confirmed clue from Byron Price, uh, having loved history, which I personally suspected, and uh, a lot of people disagreed that it's not true, but it is true. And I take it a step further in that I believe the entire book, the narrative of the book, is uh, using fair folk to tell the story of real world, real life historical figures. And we'll get more into that as we move along on with these clues. Byron Price uh, was revealed to have revered Teddy Roosevelt, which I'm so excited because I had just recently predicted that the Chicago puzzle is in fact all about Teddy Roosevelt. If you look at the the image of which is a hybrid of time bandits and Teddy Roosevelt's uh, pictures, portraits, uh, you can see the string with the ring connecting different components. That's how his glasses, in fact, were tied to a, a ring that had a string on it. And so for me, uh, what also helped is the fact that there was a clue in the verse and telling you that it was across the street from Roosevelt University. There is also a Roosevelt Metro Station and a Roosevelt Road. So I'm good to go in believing that the Chicago puzzle is all about Ro Teddy Roosevelt. Number five, Byron Price was fascinated by the Civil War, again, hitting the nail on the head for my Fort Mason theory. Um, as I've explained in the past in my other videos, to death, I have beat this poor horse. Um, I'm convinced that it has that the casket's buried at Fort Mason. Both John C. Fremont and Irvin McDowell once lived there and are integral uh, pieces of the puzzle. Why? They were Civil War generals. In fact, Irvin McDowell is most famous for having lost miserably 
to Stonewall Jackson, hence at Stonewall's door. His house was once called McDowell Hall, now the general's residence. Again, there's military uh, items all throughout, cannons, you name it. It's an, an amazing place. I recommend visiting, even if you don't believe uh, the cask is buried there. Number four. Another confirmed clue, paintings should be studied by their orientation. Again, this is so exciting for me because I'm one of the firm believers that the backwards H and G around her color in image one need to be reversed. And then you get the G and H for Ghirardelli chocolates, which is by the turntable cable car uh, at Aquatic Park, which is on the right of Golden Gate Park, which is the main symbol. For this image. In line with this, I believe the Montreal, and I don't believe anybody else has been pushing this, but I'm more than ever now convinced it should be upside down. For me, the number one telltale sign is the eyes. The eyes do not become distorted when you turn it upside down. Therefore, the stepping stone, the step, step structure, for lack of a better description, around his collar. Um, people believe matches rooftops um, for buildings. And if it were right side up, that doesn't make any sense. Why would he describe steps going down instead of up? So if you reverse it upside down, it's a perfect fit for the puzzle. Number three, the paintings should be viewed as bookends. So people have already been discussing this, um, which is fascinating, but I'm not able to catch on, and this is where I can be the first to admit when I can take a step back and say, I have no I don't know how to understand this or interpret this, so I'm just gonna let others do the work um, and then you know do some due diligence and trying to understand if they're correct or not and support them in any way that I can. But for now, I have no idea what, what is intended by bookends. Number two, paintings did not use any template. This is absolutely critical. Um, so many of us have spent years pondering whether he used a checklist to exactly mimic all the puzzles and while he did use some common denominators like you know the coordinates in the painting things like that um i, I he has now confirmed that no they did not make sure that if there were 12 clues in one puzzle they would be 12 clues across all the puzzles or you know if there were 24 clues in one that all of them would have 24 clues um, apparently every painting is unique every puzzle is unique so as you see these cookie cutter shapes here um, I've used this because it's the perfect example one puzzle is about a Christmas tree a different puzzle is about gingerbread men another puzzle is about candy canes the each puzzle is about a different topic and they used I'm assuming whatever number of clues it took to convey the subject that they were that the puzzle is about and last but not least, the most important clue of all, the artist spoke very freely and was almost nonchalant about the details of the solved puzzles. For years now, I have been arguing that this is the number one way that we're going to find the rest of the uh, casks and solve the remaining puzzles. If he is able to confirm that the clues we believe to be true in the puzzles that have already been solved, are, are what we think they are that will completely change the game it'll literally be a game changer and that we'll be able to better look at the remaining puzzles and interpret things more properly more correctly and that is going to be uh, the the best way to find the remaining puzzles before it's too late it has been 40 years lord knows how much time is left before they'll be lost to time anyhow that's all for today thank you so much hope you enjoyed this give me some feedback in the comments below cheers